Diarrhea by Melanie Baskin and Dr. Bridget Roan. Learning Objectives By the end of this video, the viewer should be able to review the basic pathophysiology of diarrhea, describe the clinical presentation of a pediatric patient with diarrhea, develop a differential diagnosis for a pediatric patient with diarrhea, and understand the management of a child who presents with diarrhea. Introduction Diarrhea, as defined by the World Health Organization, is the passage of three or more loose or watery stools per day. In practice, stool volume and consistency can vary greatly. An infant may have eight loose stools daily, which may be normal, and a toddler may have three loose stools daily, which may also be normal. Therefore, trying to determine whether there is a significant change in the frequency and consistency of stool compared with baseline can be used as a helpful gauge of diarrhea. Worldwide, diarrhea is the second leading cause of death in children under the age of 5, and in the U.S. accounts for more than 1.5 million outpatient visits and 200,000 hospitalizations each year. Diarrhea is one of the most common chief complaints pediatricians confront, and there are many causes of it. Most episodes are acute and can be managed in the outpatient setting, but signs of dehydration and specific history and physical exam findings may warrant a more nuanced approach. Pathophysiology Diarrhea occurs when excessive fluid remains within the lumen of the intestine. As such, diarrhea can be caused by fluid oversecretion, underabsorption, or rapid transport that effectively bypasses this process. As water moves passively across the intestinal epithelium, its relative volume in the lumen is determined by osmotic gradients. The transport of sodium and chloride play the greatest role in this balance. The villus epithelial cells of the small intestine cause a net absorption of sodium, and the crypt epithelial cells cause a net secretion of chloride. Again, we are referring to net secretion and absorption. Sodium absorption is not strictly compartmentalized in the villus cells, and chloride secretion is not strictly compartmentalized in the crypt cells. An increase in the secretion of fluid into the lumen, referred to as secretory or electrolyte transport induced diarrhea, is the result of an alteration in the ion transport mechanism in epithelial cells. A classic example of secretory diarrhea is cholera, where the produced toxin induces excessive chloride transport causing large and life-threatening movement of chloride and water into the lumen of the intestine. Additional etiologies of secretory diarrheas include other enterotoxigenic microbes, congenital enteropathies, and diarrhea mediated by gastrointestinal peptides such as VIP and gastrin. Another kind of diarrhea, termed osmotic or diet-induced diarrhea, occurs when osmotically active substances remain in the lumen and lead to water retention and a loss of fluid absorption. This may occur in the presence of a non-absorbable solute, such as polyethylene glycol, or be due to reduced nutrient absorption. Examples of reduced nutrient absorption include enzyme deficiencies that prevent the breakdown of certain sugars, such as lactase deficiency or damage to the epithelial cells by infection, inflammation, or an autoimmune process, which reduces its absorptive capacity. To determine whether the diarrhea is predominantly osmotic or secretory, providers can test stool and calculate a fecal osmotic gap in milliosms per kilogram which is equal to 290 minus 2 times the stool sodium plus the stool potassium. Osmotic diarrheas are defined as having a gap greater than 75 milliosms per kilogram or 100 milliosms per kilogram, depending on the reference, with higher values being more specific. And secretory diarrhea is defined as having a gap less than 50 milliosms per kilogram. While it can be useful to think about the pathophysiology of diarrhea as either secretory or osmotic, in reality, many diarrheas are a mix of the two processes, which is often related to the nutrient intake at the time of stool testing. Clinical presentation. Despite the World Health Organization definition, any significant change in a child's normal stooling pattern should prompt evaluation, with greater concern for children who are ill-appearing, show signs of dehydration, have blood or mucus in their stool, or have underlying medical conditions. Because of the wide variety of etiologies of diarrhea, a thorough history and physical exam are critical to guide appropriate management. All children presenting with diarrhea must be evaluated for hydration status. 
providers should be attuned to acute weight changes and ask about the child's oral intake and urine output or number of wet diapers. On physical exam, look for signs of dehydration such as sunken eyes, sunken fontanelle in infants, tachycardia, dry mucous membranes, delayed capillary refill, and reduced skin turgor. Other physical exam findings may give clues to the etiology of diarrhea. Examples include rashes and joint pain that can accompany inflammatory bowel disease, distension and peritoneal signs indicating a surgical abdominal process, palpable stool associated with ankopresis, or even acute otitis media, which can have an associated diarrhea in young children. Diagnosis. Taking a careful history is the most important step in narrowing down what is a very large initial differential, starting with the chronicity of the diarrhea. Acute episodes are considered to be less than two weeks, and chronic diarrhea is greater than four weeks in duration. Age, recent travel history, sick contacts, a history of recent antibiotic use, initiation of a new medication, and evidence of immunodeficiency or systemic illness. Color and consistency are two important factors to consider when creating a differential diagnosis for any concern related to stool, not just diarrhea. Troubling colors include red and black, which could indicate a lower versus upper GI bleed, respectively, and white, indicating a hepatobiliary source. Bloody diarrhea may be due to infection, ischemia, allergy, or immune-mediated inflammation, such as inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD. Foul-smelling or floating stools or the presence of mucus, fat, and or undigested food particles can all suggest malabsorption. Diarrhea associated with low-grade fevers, vomiting, and or respiratory symptoms are more consistent with viral causes of acute diarrhea. In places where the rotavirus vaccine is available, neurovirus is now the leading cause of viral gastroenteritis in children. If there is concern for a bacterial infection, providers should consider pursuing a more extensive workup, starting with stool cultures for Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, Yersinia, and Shiga toxin-producing E. coli. Clostridium difficile testing should also be considered as community-acquired infections are increasing, especially if there was recent antibiotic use. Children under the age of 2 may be asymptomatic carriers, so testing should be performed after careful consideration. Children who have traveled or are in endemic areas should have their stool tested for ova and parasites. The results of these tests will inform treatment not covered here. If a child with acute diarrhea is ill-appearing, the workup is more extensive. In addition to stool cultures, this may include a basic metabolic panel, electrolytes including rapid glucose, BUN, and creatinine, a complete blood count including differential, a peripheral blood smear to assess for hemolytic uremic syndrome, and a blood culture. Plain abdominal radiographs are only necessary in patients with suspicion of toxic megacolon, peritonitis, or perforation. An ultrasound may be performed to rule out intussusception or appendicitis. Chronic causes of diarrhea should be thought about differently. A history of weight loss or blood in the stool should prompt a workup for IBD, which likely includes blood work for inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein, stool studies such as fecal calprotectin or lactoferrin, markers for neutrophil activity, colonoscopy, and abdominal imaging. Weight loss can also be an early sign of celiac disease, for which tissue transglutaminase immunoglobulin antibody testing should be obtained. Celiac disease is also on the differential for patients suspected of malabsorption, along with lactase deficiency, pancreatic insufficiency, and post-infectious diarrhea that can occur due to villus atrophy from mucosal injury. Much more rarely, chronic diarrhea can be caused by motility disorders, hyperthyroidism, immunodeficiency syndromes, or neuroendocrine tumors, and if seen in neonates or infants, congenital enteropathies. Diarrhea that does not reveal an organic cause on workup, meaning there is not an identifiable anatomic, chemical, or biologic cause, is referred to as functional diarrhea. This is extremely common. In children less than 5, this is called chronic nonspecific diarrhea, or toddler's diarrhea, which can be due to overfeeding, excessive formula intake, and or a diet high in fruit juice or sorbitol. 
In children over five, one of the most common functional diarrheas is diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS. This can be diagnosed with the Rome 4 criteria, which includes an association with abdominal pain. Management. Management of diarrhea depends on whether the diarrhea is acute or chronic. For acute diarrhea, management is supportive and focuses particularly on rehydration. For chronic diarrhea, management depends on treating the underlying cause if known or possible. Most commonly, children with diarrhea can be managed with supportive care in the outpatient setting. If it is an acute episode of diarrhea, such as gastroenteritis, they can be managed with oral rehydration solution to preserve hydration status. The World Health Organization oral rehydration solution is hypoosmolar with optimized glucose to sodium ratios to increase water absorption through the sodium glucose co-transporter SGLT1 and sodium coupled amino acid transporters. Admission for rehydration should be considered for children with electrolyte abnormalities, lack of improvement with rehydration, inability to drink, or suspicion for systemic illnesses such as hemolytic uremic syndrome. A trial of fasting can be considered for suspected osmotic or diet-induced diarrhea, but otherwise a normal diet should be resumed as soon as it is tolerable. Anti-motility agents such as loperamide are not recommended in children. Antiemetics such as ondansetron can be used in children older than six months with nausea and vomiting, but should be used cautiously in anyone with electrolyte abnormalities or who are otherwise at risk for cardiac arrhythmias given the potential for QT prolongation. The effectiveness of probiotics is controversial, but there is evidence that certain commensal species may help in antibiotic-associated diarrhea, IBS, or acute infectious diarrhea. Summary in summary, diarrhea is an extremely common, chief complaint in the pediatric world. In resource-rich settings, diarrhea is rarely life-threatening, but if it is severe or occurs in a patient from a vulnerable population, it should be investigated. A thorough history and physical exam will help narrow down a large differential, but most acute cases can be managed without further testing in an outpatient setting. Thank you for watching this video on diarrhea.